some of the benches were occupied. Renegade apothecaries from a variety of legions and warbands sat or stood, waiting for them. There were 30 of them, not counting their accompanying slaves, bodyguards, and servitors. He saw some faces he recognized, fellow sons of the Third Legion. Others here were new arrivals. The members of the consortium came and went as it pleased them unless Vile wished otherwise. Whatever their origin, all bore some signs of their calling, coats of flayed flesh worn in overt mimicry of their leader, ornaments of bone, surgical dendrite harnesses, and signs of self-experimentation abounded. These alterations often went beyond the cosmetic and into realms of wild fancy. Narthicum's word and clicked, and internal sensors tested the air and took surreptitious bio-readings. Brutally modified servitors and mutant scribes stood behind their masters, patiently noting and muttering observations. The work could not be postponed, not even for a meeting such as this. Servo skulls hovered about the chamber recording all that occurred for Bile's later examination. Those who failed to show the proper level of interest would be punished or perhaps promoted, depending on his whims. The stink of the consortium hall was like a physical blow. It washed over Oleander as he followed Bile down to the dais. The air was thick with a thug of chemicals and spoiled meat and sour blood. It was not the smell of a slaughterhouse, but instead that of discovery. The reek of exploration, here as nowhere else, were the secrets of life and death studied and improved upon. Here, in these halls, new races of gods and monsters were raised up and dashed down. He'd almost miss the smell of it. Igori and the other gland hounds took up positions near the doors, as was tradition. Their weapons trained on the gathered apothecaries. It was more a symbolic gesture than an actual threat, but few questioned it. At least not more than once. No one would be allowed to leave until a decision was reached. Those who tried often found themselves occupying several of Bile's nutrient tanks simultaneously. Bile took his place upon the dais and thumped the floor with his scepter. Once, thrice, three times, until every eye was on him. <laughs> Brothers, attend me, he said. We have a matter of some import to discuss. Step forward, Oleander Call. Step forward and be recognized by the consortium. Hey friends, it's me, the Ebony Otaku, the well-rounded nerd. So we are stepping back into Fabius Biles' consortium with Oleander where we left off last time. And has Oleander made a good choice or a bad choice with what remains of his life? Just a quick catch up to remind ourselves, Oleander was one of Bile's faithful, his most faithful of servant, uh, for whatever reason, got kicked off, ran out, uh, and then was dumb enough to come back. But he knows he can only come back if he has something that his master would really want. And Oleander thinks he has that. Otherwise, why would he risk it? Because Bile be crazy. Okay, that's that's just how it is. <laughs> um, and as we um, we read through, um, Oleander has made it into Bile's palace on his craft world that he's taken over. Um, he is in front of all of those who are still loyal to Bile. They have kind of an amphitheater thing going on where um, they discuss important things. Uh, don't, it's kind let me back up. We have to remember that Fabius Bile and all of the Space Marines are functionally immortal. I've used that phrase a few times. What do I mean by functionally 
immortal. Unless an outside force acts upon them to end their lives, war, poison, assassination attempt, any of those things, unless something from the outside interferes with their ability to live, they will keep on living. Now, we in other fantasies know of immortal beings like gods and whatnot, nothing kills them. Like, you know, we, we think of, um, what's a good mythological being? Oh, Anubis from Egyptian mythology. You can't, you can't kill the god of the underworld. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can take his head off. He just gonna grow a new one because God of the dead, that's what they do. Um, to be functionally immortal means as long as your systems are functioning, you're going to function and you're going to live. Now, over time, there can be decay. And remember, the emperor's children, of which Fabius Bile was one, and many of those that broke away and followed him, you know, Fulgrim's Legion, there was a blight in their DNA sequence. So the gene seed that came from Fulgrim that went into his space marines was corrupted. And in turn, he had a corrupted legion. And when I say corrupted, I mean genetically corrupted. His legionaries were not perfect. They came out with deformities and being useless. And Fabius Bile was the apothecary who was instrumental in wiping out that blight. Now, here's the problem. Space marines are supposed to be functionally immortal. But with this blight that plagues Fulgrim's legion, they're not anymore. They're supposed to be able to live forever unless war takes them out. And this particular set of space marines cannot do that. And that is the crux of Bile's reason to be. To Fabius Bile, his immortality has been stolen from him. Because the Emperor made a mistake, Fulgrim made a mistake, Some someone out there owes him. <laughs> and he is taking his fury out on everybody who has nothing to do with his problems. We all know somebody who takes their problems out on the world, of which none of us have any um, doing for those problems existing. <laughs> you know them. Don't mention them in the comments. Bile has an internal vendetta against the universe that has cheated him, wronged him, uh, made it where he cannot be or do what he was meant to be or do. He cannot abide that. He cannot handle that. So he sets his life up in such a way that he is now in pursuit of that immortality that has not been automatically gifted to him for the sake of being a space marine. It's his birthright. He's going to get his birthright back. And he doesn't care who he has to take out in the process of making that happen. And then there are those who follow Bile. What is his, what are their motivations? Freedom for some of them. Some of them are always sick and twisted. And now they have a leader who is equally sick and twisted and lets them carry on with their whatever they're doing at any time of the day or night. Um, and then there are some who just wanted something different, better, more exciting than the world they were in. Everyone has different motivations for where they end up in this world. And Bile will take advantage of all of it. He doesn't care why you're there. As long as you're there and you're doing the good work, he could care less. You're here. So let's hear Oleander make his offering uh, to this group of former heroes of the Imperium of Man and see if he has something of worth that will allow his head to stay properly positioned on his neck. Silence fell as Oleander stepped onto the dais. He scanned the gathered faces, spotting Arian and the others instantly. Sakara looked as if he'd rather have been anywhere, uncomfortable among the ranks of those he'd considered heretics. Arian lounged, murmuring into his skulls. And Zemiskis. Zemiskis was as unreadable as a wall of iron. Speak, Oleander, Bile said, gesturing him forward. Convince them, if you can. Oleander cleared his throat, <clears> throat> 
and he let his hand rest on the pommel of his sword. Greetings, brothers. It has been some time, he said. A murmur swept along the benches. Oleander waited until it grew quiet before continuing. We have come through dark times together, my brothers. From the killing fields of Terra to the seas of Gnosis, we have only ever sought illumination. When the Canticle City burned, a century or more of knowledge was lost, and many of our brothers with it killed by savages, by a Chthonian barbarian and his band of murderers. But we persevered. We rose from the ashes, born aloft on wings of purpose. Get on with it, one of the apothecaries said. He wore a cowl of robes made from stretched and sutured flesh over his battered war plate and the skin's still functioning capillaries flushed as he gestured impatiently. Others added their voices to the demand. The consortium had never been what one would call serene, a band of lunatics, bound by deceit and malice, ever seeking their own perfection at the expense of their fellows. They had a little patience for anything that took them from their experiments for even the briefest moment. Another way in which the students emulated the master. He glanced at Bile and wondered what the point of this particular test was. Bile gestured and Oleander continued. And it is the purpose which brings me to you today. In the void of a treasure trove of raw materials sits undefended. A craft world of the terrified, perdiferous Eldar. I offer it up to you, if you will but aid me in taking it. A moment of silence followed. A craft world was a prize worth a few seconds of consideration. Then suspicion reared its head. And what do you get out of it? Someone asked. The apothecary was clad in red, his armor flexing like a second skin as the drug pumps affixed to his armor's power unit hissed. Weirdly colored smoke spilled out of the vents of his helmet. A servitor... Its bulky frame studded with the chemical tanks stood behind him. Its mouth had been replaced by a dispensing node, and a profusion of canisters bubbled there. It shuddered as its master extracted an empty canister from his pumps and replaced it with a full one drawn from the servitor's maw. The joy of fighting alongside my brother is once more, Gorel, Oleander said. A ripple of diversive laughter spread through the chamber. The joy of picking over our corpses more like, Gorel said. He had always been a sour creature, concerned only with the potency and effects of his chemical concoctions. Like he did with Scaripides, someone else added. The apothecary wore a stained penitence robes over his power armor, concealing everything save the serpentine dendrites that coiled and thrashed about him. One of the dendrites stiffened abruptly and slid its sharpened tip into the sacrifice flesh of a bond slave squatting nearby, extracting what passed for blood. A second slave bent close, wanting to be tattooed with whatever conclusion her master had suddenly come to. Oleander could almost feel the hostility radiating from the gathered apothecaries. None of them liked to be reminded of what had happened to Scaripides, however necessary it had been. He had been a Lenarin agent, but well liked for that. No one blamed the sons of Alpharius for doing what came naturally, and no one wanted to be reminded that they were all ultimately expendable in the eyes of their leader. 
an apothecary in dark armor of a night lord rose to his feet. Decorations of bone rattled against Ceramite as he did so, and his bodyguards growled eagerly, goatish lips peeling back from broken fangs. The goat-headed mutants quivered, hands on their skinny knives, ready to attack at their master's order. You have no brothers here, Oleander, he said. Or if you did, you butchered them, the way we should butcher you, and feed your guts to the beast and howl around our towers. He activated the drill on his anarthicum for emphasis, and his beast yelped hungrily. Let's strip his glad hands first, Duco, Gorel said. I'd wager his prodiginoids are still good. If you kit those, I kit his betcher's hand. This from one of the penitent's robes. Have you what you want, but his mercrinoid implant is mine, Mrag, said another, a leprous monster with stained bandages on his bare arms and syringes on his fingertips. He bared teeth gone black with rot in too wide a smile. And maybe a dermal sample as well. I'll have his brain, but I'm willing to share, Duco the Night Lord growled. One bite. A piece. What say? He looked around. There must be something of value in that crooked mind of his. Otherwise, Fabius wouldn't have spared his life. Oleander tensed as voices rose from the benches, harvesting him where he stood. Drills whirred and blades clicked throughout the chamber. Bile smiled at him. You see how they've missed you, Oleander, he said. Have no fear. I'll not let Duco have your brain, nor any of the others. I have such interesting plans for it. Bile thumped the dais with a scepter as a roar from the benches swelled. The gathered apothecaries fell silent almost at once. My brothers, please attend carefully. You have heard Apothecary Oleander's proposal. It is now time for you to determine its merit. Who will step forward and join his fate to that of our prodigal brother? Bile said. Oleander felt the gaze of every apothecary in the rotunda fixed on him. He was no witch, but he could tell their thoughts well enough. For most, he was nothing more than a momentary distraction from their experiments. For the rest, he was a bundle of spare parts. The eyes of these affixed on him with greedy intensity, already parceling him out according to their requirements. He began to wonder if this were not a test at all, but rather the prelude to an execution. Silence held on for long moments. Oleander scanned the auditorium, wondering if he could fight his way out for a second time in a lifetime. Even if he could, there was a little chance he would reach his ship. Not in one piece, anyway. Zemiski stood, and silence fell. The Iron Warrior slowly made his way to Oleander's side. All eyes watched his progress. A gauntlet dropped heavily onto Oleander's shoulder. The iron fingers tightened, and a disgruntled sigh went up from the crowd. Oleander looked at the other apothecary. Brother, he said. Zemiskis nodded and turned to face the crowd. Arian stood. Ah, well, I can't let gentle Zemiskis go alone. Who knows what might happen to him without someone to watch his back? He strode up to the dais, hands on the hilt of his blades. Besides, I haven't tasted Eldar flesh in some time. Bile nodded approvingly. Excellent. Anyone else? 
Sakara. He gestured and Sakara stood. You will accompany us a well, I think. Do you have any objections? The word bearer stopped before Bile and spat his feet. Bile laughed. No, I suppose not. The chief apothecary thumped the dais with the haft of his scepter. The proposition is accepted. The rest of you are free to return to your experience and experiments. Gorel, you shall be in command of the apothecarian until I return. Gorel twitched in surprise. The auditorium began to empty. Baleful glances were tossed in Gorel's way, but no one spoke out. Oleander wondered what he'd done to earn Bile's ire. The chances of him still being in one piece when they returned were slim. Very well, Oleander. You've managed to save your skin. For the moment, Bile said. At last, the consortium chamber emptied. I know why you wished for my help. But now, perhaps you will share the first step of your daring plan with your fellow apothecaries. Of course, Master, Oleander said. We require a guide capable of leading us to where our quarry works, or to wherever it might choose to flee. You've come to the wrong place, then, Sakara said. I doubt any of us here would know how to find your craft world, unless Zeminski's is keeping secrets. He glanced at the Iron Warrior, who shrugged. The word bearer tapped one of the icons on his adorned armor. I could seek aid from the Neverborn. That won't be necessary, will it, Oyanda? Bile said. I know where to find a guide, Oleander said, but I doubt they will be willing. Wherever are they? Arian asked. Quite. Bile pointed, torment at Oleander. Where will we find this guide of yours? Sublime, Oleander said. There are so many words that I'm not sure are actual words in these Warhammer novels, <laughs> but we do our best with them anyway. Now the question becomes, will they survive their attempt to gain a guide to get to this craft world? Because in the future, there is only war. And that's not just for the humans, that's for everybody. For the uninitiated, a craft world is an Eldar world. The Eldar home world was destroyed many eons ago, and they basically built planet-sized ships called craft world. Think of it as floating uh, Rivendales <laughs> out there because the Eldar are the space elves. Um, they're floating Rivendales out there uh, to remain alive. Now, as far as Eldar numbers are concerned, they've been greatly reduced. But in terms of... Um, there are still amount of living beings. There's still quite a few of them, but they're just nowhere near at the numbers they were when they had their own actual home worlds. Um, over time, things have happened. They don't happen anymore. Craft worlds exist. And there are a number of craft worlds out there that exist where there apparently are no living Eldar on them. Blights took them out, war, raids, all kinds of things. And some of it was even the Eldar's own hubris. Um, Sea Angel Exterminatus for reference. But now Oleander has his crew. He has the approval of his master and they are going to set off on an adventure. So I think in the next one, uh, if I don't uh, jump into another uh, great story I want to read uh, from Warhammer, uh, we will continue this story. I'll decide when I get there because there's just so much and there's a story from tales of heresy that i'm dying to read so yay so i hope you enjoyed that please like comment and subscribe and i will see you in the next one